coding uh, to cope up with the new normal that we're experiencing now. Um, this this script webinar was uh, is uh, is developed by our CPD committee headed by uh, our past president Adam Abinades, and you will see the rest of our CPD committee members. So, uh, congratulations, CPD committee. So uh, this um, this webinar uh, is sponsored by Rasa Surveying, no? and um, and we are grateful that uh, we were able to get them to be one of our uh, sponsors for evaluate for this evaluation of retrofitting of reinforced concrete structure seminar. So so again, I would like to welcome everyone, and uh, definitely uh, we have very good speakers, Dr. Uh, Mac Mendoza and our past president again, Adam Abinales, who will be talking about how to properly uh, retrofit uh, existing structures. So I hope that you will have a good afternoon and I, I hope we learn a lot from this uh, seminar. Thank you very much and we hope to see you again in the forthcoming seminars. Yeah, back to you, Leo. Thank you, Engineer Rani Eason. Now uh, I will introduce the person who will introduce our first speaker. For uh, the, for our first introduction of the uh, of the who will introduce the first uh, presenter, uh, we we have Dr. Alessandro Estelito Garciano. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for the first presenter of this webinar, I am very pleased to introduce Dr. Rodolfo Mac Mendoza Jr. Dr. Mendoza is an associate professor, associate professor, professorial lecturer at the Department of Civil Engineering at De La, Salle, De La Salle University, Manila, in the Structural Engineering Division. He obtained his Doctor of Engineering degree at Nagoya University in 2018, where he developed a numerical method for evaluating the performance of retrofitted concrete structures. He is currently the project manager of Mynilad's Seismic Resilience Program and concurrently work as a consultant of the Structural Restoration of San Sebastian Basilica, MRT3 and NSCR. He was a former visiting researcher at the National Center for Research on Earthquake Engineering or ENCRI in Taipei, where he studied nonlinear analysis of buildings. He is also a reviewer of Elsevier's Engineering Structures Journal and MDPI's Materials Journal. He is currently a member committee of Task Group 1.1, Improving Seismic Resilience of Reinforced Concrete Structures of the International Association for Bridge and Structural Engineering, or IABSE, and also serves as a member committee for NSCP Structural Concrete and as a chair of NSCP Steel Committee. Without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Mark Mendoza. Uh. Thank you, Doc G, uh, for that uh, kind introduction. And uh, good afternoon again, uh, everyone. And welcome uh, to this uh, first webinar of ASAP. Um, I am actually uh, privileged to be the first speaker of this uh, ASAP webinar uh, series. And today I will be presenting to you some of the approaches and codes and standards that we normally use in conducting structural evaluation of existing uh, structures. <clears throat> so the outline of my uh, presentation for this afternoon would be as follows. Uh, first, uh, I would like to discuss the different reasons why we want to conduct a structural evaluation on an existing structure, followed by some of the approaches, uh, codes, guidelines, and standards in conducting these evaluations. And then we dive in specifically in conducting a structural evaluation or seismic evaluation of existing structures 
where I will provide a, an overview of the ASC 41 standard. And I will also introduce to you the international existing building code. Um, and then I will present an hypothetical example that would give us some insights on the difference in conducting an evaluation using a code base evaluation and using a performance base evaluation. Uh, so please allow me to start. So the first thing that we should know when conducting structural evaluation is knowing the purpose, why the owner or the stakeholder wants us to conduct a structural evaluation. Why does the owner wants us to evaluate their structure? Now in doing so, we need first to have a definition of what is really a structural evaluation. And this uh, descriptions that are given in the slide are basically based on our experience and practice and based on the experience of the colleagues um, in the industry of structural engineering. So basically we can define our structural evaluation can be defined as a process of determining the capacity of an existing structure in relation to the level of service that it actually provides. Now, when we say structural evaluation, uh, the evaluation may include a structural assessment or a structural analysis or both. Now, when we say structural assessment, it may include a condition assessment, which aims to determine the extent and source of defects in, in an existing structure, and may also include determination of in place properties of the materials using both destructive and non-destructive methods. Now a structural analysis on the other hand is performed to compare the capacity of existing structural members to their structural demands. Now in the Philippines, that is a normal uh, reaction to structural engineers who were asked to conduct a structural evaluation to assume that the evaluation is a seismic evaluation. Now, this is clearly understandable because being an earthquake prone country um, and time and time again, as a structural engineers in our practice, we prove that the governing load cases in most, in most situations are the load combinations that include earthquake loadings. But there are several reasons why we conduct structural evaluations. And in this slide, I categorize this different purposes of structural evaluation into three. The first one being the change in resistance or change in strength. So we conduct a structural evaluation because there is a change in the capacity of the structure. There is a change in the intended capacity of the structure. Now we also conduct a structural evaluation because there is a change in loads or structural demands. Or we also conduct structural evaluation when there is an aging in the structure. There's a recognized aging in the structure. Now under these categories, we can actually define in detail what are the reasons behind this change in strength, change in loads, and aging in structures. So starting with the structural evaluation that is triggered by what we call a change in resistance or a change in strength. Now, one of the reasons why there is a change in strength or change in resistance in the structure is because there's a damage in the structure. And therefore, if there's a damage in the structure, the structural evaluation that we want to perform is what we call a damage assessment. Now, damage assessment is performed basically to determine the extent of damage incurred by the structure to certain events, such as earthquake, typhoon, and fire. Some examples given in the slides are some of the damage observed in a structural building, in school building, after an earthquake, in the 2019 Cotabato earthquake, and a fire damage uh, part of the Skyway 3 project. 
Now, a structural evaluation is also conducted whenever there is a change in resistance because of the deterioration of the structure. And this type of evaluation is what we call a structural condition assessment. Now, this assessment is normally requested when there is a visible evidence of structural deterioration, such as cracking and corrosion of steel and steel reinforcement. So in the figure, we can see some spalling of concrete, which is induced by the corrosion of reinforcement. Um, so if you are conducting a structural evaluation, your goal is to determine the source of this corrosion, whether it is a carbonation induced or chloride induced corrosion. And you may want also to check the crack widths in an existing structure and compare them with some allowable or tolerable crack widths, for example, we allow 0.41 millimeter crack width for interior structural members, and you may want to compare if the cracks in an existing structure are actually exceeding those limits. Then you may want to check also if there is a um, reduction in the pH of concrete, which may actually trigger the corrosion of reinforcement. So we, we want to determine the depth of carbonation and compare it with the concrete cover depth uh, to check if uh, there is already a potential for corrosion to occur. Now, another, another triggering uh, mechanism why we would conduct a structural evaluation is where, in, where there is a change in resistance because of the inadequate use of materials, maybe unintentionally during construction. Now, this structural assessment may be required when the capacity of the structural member is in question because of our possible low compressive strength and similar flaws during construction. Now, some of the uh, different conditions where we conduct structural evaluation due to a change in loads is when there is a change in occupancy. Particularly, it is required when the where there is a change in use in the structure, such as changes or changing the structure from a residential facility into a storage area or a commercial center. Then um, commonly a structural evaluation is required. Now, another reason is when there are building addition or alteration, for example, the owner would like to add additional story to the existing building and in such cases, structural evaluation must be performed in order to check if the existing structure can accommodate or has the residual capacity to accommodate the addition. Now we also do structural evaluation when there is a new equipment added to the existing building, which is very common in manufacturing industry. For example, the industry would like to increase the production of the plant and would like to introduce this new equipment. So a structural evaluation is needed to determine if the existing structural elements can able to support this added uh, equipment or machinery. Now with regard to the structural evaluation that is uh, triggered by the aging of structures, one of them is what we call structural integrity assessment. Now, this evaluation is performed when the existing capacity of structural elements are in question because of the age of the structure. Now, this uh, evaluation normally consists of both structural assessment and a structural analysis. And this is normally performed in all the structures that do not qualify as heritage structure. Now, aging of structures also include the structural evaluation and restoration of historic landmarks. Now, the structural evaluation of heritage structures requires special treatment as conser conservation principles normally govern the repair strategy. Now, the challenge in doing an evaluation on heritage structures is how to properly characterize the materials used in the original construction, and basically how to maintain the intervention at, at minimum in order to retain the historicity of the structure. Now, there is also a type of structural evaluation 
that is normally performed in an existing structure when there is what we call a property acquisition. And this type of structural evaluation is what we call structural due diligence. So basically this is performed to assess the in-place structural condition of an existing structure normally during a property acquisition. And the aim of the investigation really is to determine the structural risks associated with the future use of the building, which can be used as an appraisal to the structure. And of course, the most common uh, structural evaluation uh, performed here in the Philippines is a seismic evaluation. And a seismic evaluation is really uh, conducted to determine is uh, to determine if a structure has an adequate uh, resistance to an earthquake. Now, normally it is triggered by the age of the structure, particularly if a structure was actually designed and constructed prior to the implementation of a comprehensive seismic uh, code. Now, with this uh, introduction of different types of uh, triggers for us to conduct a structural evaluation, we go now to what are the codes, standards, guidelines, and references that we can use in conducting these different types of structural evaluation? Now, when there is a, uh, what we call a change in resistance, and when we want to do a damage assessment, for example, for buildings that were subjected to earthquake, a common type of damage assessment that we perform is what we call a post-earthquake evaluation. Now it is performed to existing structures that were hit by a large magnitude earthquake. Now a common reference to use in conducting such evaluation is what we call the ATC-20 published by the Applied Technology Council. Now a very good initiative by ASAP is the introduction of the Disaster Mitigation Preparedness and Response Program, what we call DAMPER, which actually provides you a training on how to perform such post-earthquake evaluation. And it follows a similar procedure to that of ATC-20. Now, you may also perform a damage assessment when a structure is uh, damaged by fire. And in terms of codes and standards, there is no really a consensus document that is used in the assessment of structures damaged by fire. In some cases, um, you can actually use as a reference the TR-68 guide from Concrete Society, it's a European guideline. And it will tell you that some of the important information that you need to, you need to collect during a damage assessment of a fire damage structure are the concrete cover, the duration of fire basically to determine the maximum temperature that was, uh, that was uh, where the elements were exposed and also the source of fire so that you can see the variation of temperature across the structure. Now, of course, if you are to conduct a structural condition assessment, Again, the intent is to determine the source and extent of deterioration in existing structure. Now, in conducting a structural condition assessment, it is normally supplemented by destructive and non-destructive evaluation of existing materials. And in, in, in conducting such evaluation, the ASC 11 is normally used as a guide in performing this uh, assessment. Now for, for structural evaluation that are induced by the change in structural demands, of course, the main uh, code or standard that we use in assessing the, a structure that is uh, where there are change in use or occupancy is what we call the uh, National Structural Code of the Philippines. So basically, whenever there are some uh, evaluation that were triggered by the addition of floor area, addition of story, then uh, normally we use the 
new code provisions in order to evaluate if the existing structure can support additional loadings. And of course, we know the NSCP is a compendium of several standards, such as the UB, UBC for the earthquake, ASCE 7 for wind, and so on. Now for codes, uh, standards, and guidelines we use in evaluating uh, existing structures uh, that were induced by the age of these structures, we have the following. Now in conducting a structural integrity assessment, for example, particularly when the focus is not really on the seismic evaluation, but on the gravity assessment of existing structures. And in doing so, we normally use again the National Structural Code of the Philippines in performing the evaluation. And also uh, there's a new standard that was released by ACI, we call it the ACI 562, can also be used to evaluate an existing structure, um, even if you are only assessing the gravity, um, gravity system of the structure. Now the ACI 562, is also performance-based in nature, and it also uh, refer to the ASCE 41 if you are conducting a seismic evaluation. ASCI 562 has its own set of load combination as well as reduction factors, so it can be it can be used as a standalone standard in evaluating an existing structure. Now, how about for heritage structures? Now in heritage structures, there is also no local consensus, or even an international consensus on what standard to use in doing this evaluation. But there are references and the refer one of the best references that I can recommend is what we call the Secretary of the Interior Standard for the treatment of historic properties. So it is not really a technical uh, reference, but rather is a practical uh, a reference that gives you a guide in how to preserve, how to prioritize, um, uh, prioritize structural elements in doing the evaluation of this historic structure. So basically, um, this document already include that aspect of conservation in doing the evaluation. Then we also have other references from EABSE, the SED 15, as well as some of the case studies of uh, EABSE. Now let's move on now to seismic evaluation. And I understand that all of us here have already encountered someone who asks us to perform a seismic evaluation of their existing structure. Now in conducting such evaluation, it is a natural question among the practicing structural engineers on what code to use in conducting such evaluation. Are you going to use a performance-based velocity in evaluating the existing structure, or are you going to use a code-based velocity in an existing structure? So to answer this question, uh, I allotted uh, a huge uh, part of this, of this presentation on discussing the how to do a seismic evaluation of an existing structure, what are the approaches, what are the codes and standards that we can use to perform such evaluation. And to do so, we need to define what is a seismic evaluation and why do we perform seismic evaluation of existing structures? Well, uh, we perform seismic evaluation of existing structures because we all know that existing structure, particularly those that were designed way back before the implementation of a stringent seismic code are actually expected to be non-conforming to the prescriptive rules of the new seismic code provisions. The objective is not to redesign these buildings to meet new code provisions, but really just to manage the seismic creeps by understanding how these structural components will behave and respond under earthquake shaking. And our objective really is to provide a minimum level of safety. Now, again, the natural question among structural engineers, what code or standard to use? 
Now, I would say that there are two groups of engineers uh, that can that are somehow debating on this one. There's this, there's this what we call a code-based approaches and what we call performance-based approaches. Now, code-based approach in, in evaluating an existing structure is commonly preferred because of its simplicity and of course our familiarity in using a code-based procedure to evaluate an existing structure. Now, there are also people who prefer the performance-based approach because of its capability in quantifying the response of a building against an explicit target performance that is not directly feasible under traditional prescriptive design standards. So it is a common question to all of us, what approach to use in evaluating an existing structure? Now, these are the standards and codes that we use and evaluate in, in doing seismic evaluation. Again, it can be a code-based approach. It can be a performance-based approach. Now, in the code base, we normally use the NSCP. And in, in performance-based evaluation, we normally use the ASCE 41. Now, there are other references available in the literature, such as the AS, ACI 562 and some old references such as the FEMA 273. But what I would like to introduce today is the use of what we call the International Existing Building Code. Now, what is this International Building Code? Well, this, build, this one is a model code. It's a model code for evaluating existing building. And today, I would like to focus my discussion on ASCE 41 and the International Existing Building Code. Now, these two references can be considered as the two current state-of-the-art references in evaluating an existing structure, particularly when we are conducting seismic evaluation. In both methods, the evaluation consists of structural assessment and structural analysis. ASCE 41 is a standard, while IEBC is a model code that has already been adopted in the US. Now, I would like to start by providing some overview of ASCE 41. Now, what is ASCE 41? And I'm sure from the several conferences and lectures that we have, we always hear about this. ASCE 41 standard. So basically this is standard uses a performance-based design philosophy in performing seismic evaluation and retrofit of existing building. Now, these concepts are implemented by selecting a building performance objective. And this building performance objective is achieved by pairing what we call building performance level and seismic hazard levels. Now, what are building performance objectives then? Well, in building performance objective, you answer the question, how much damage is acceptable at a given level of shaking? So in general, in ASCE 41, there are two sets of building performance objectives. There are two main building performance objectives. One is a building performance objective for existing structure, and the other is a building performance objective for new structure. One is what we call BPOE. E stands for existing structure, and the other is BPON, that N stands for new structures. And you will notice here that that performance objective is always a function of the seismic hazard level. This is BSE. These are called seismic hazard level. And these items here are what we call, here are what we call uh, building performance level. Now, at a given seismic hazard level, there's a corresponding building performance level and a corresponding risk category. You can, you can actually think of risk category as uh, occupancy category. And normally, 
if uh, we are to, to relate these values here to our occupancy category, category one and two can be said to be a standard occupancy, risk category four can be considered as an essential facility. So this one here, BPOE, is a performance objective for existing structure. Now this one is the performance objective for new structures. Again, the purpose of performance objective is to determine what is an acceptable damage for a given level of shaking. It tells us the acceptable damage for a given level of shaking. Now, in order to define these objectives, you need to pair seismic performance level with seismic hazard level. So what are these performance levels? Now, performance level answer the questions, what happens to the building in an earthquake? So what happens to a building in an earthquake? Would it be operational? That means after an earthquake, you don't need to move out in a building. You stay in the building, automatically it's operational. Would it be immediate occupancy? That means there's a damage, but the damage is negligible and you can return to the building within 24 hours. Or could it be a life safety where there is a possibility of loss or a collapse prevention where there is a high probability of loss or collapse? Now, these performance levels are then paired with what we call seismic hazard level. And seismic hazard level basically answered the question, how severe is the shaking? Now, the seismic hazard level were divided depending on the performance object. For existing structure, what we call BPOE, we have two levels of hazard. For BSE1, for 20% in 50 years earthquake, with a return period of 225, and BSE2E is a hazard level that has 5% um, probability of happening in 50 years. Now for new design, we have what we call BSE1N and BSE2N representing the first one as DBE and the other one as MCE. Now it is important to note that there has been some changes on the definition of MCE for quite some time. Before we just call it MCE and now there is what we call MCER. Now it is very important for us to recognize that there is a huge difference between these two. MCE is based on uniform hazard and it measures what we call the probability of exceedance. While MCER is actually based on risk targeted hazard. So what it measures is the probability of structural collapse. So when I say 2% in 50 MCE, I am referring to the 2% chance of having an earthquake in 50 years. While if I say 1% in 50 MCER, that 1% is not the probability of happening, but it's the probability of collapse. There is a 1% probability that the structure would collapse in 50 years. So those two are uh, really different and we should recognize this difference uh, between these uh, two definitions. Now a fundamental difference between ASCE 41 and code base is that normally when you are using code base assessment, we are always representing the ductility of a structural building by a system ductility, we commonly refer as the response modification factor. In the contrary, when we are doing a performance-based assessment, we focus more on what we call, uh, we focus more on what we call a component evaluation because we want to evaluate the ductility of a building based on their member component. So that is, really the difference between the two. Now, another important uh, uh, the feature of performance-based philosophy is that, again, it has the ability to quantify the response of a building against an explicit target performance, which is not directly possible for code-based assessment. 
So this gives you an overview of ASE 8.1. There are 17 chapters, and there are some chapters that are specific, specifically addresses the analysis procedures and some acceptance criteria for steel, concrete, and masonry. Now, in terms of types of analysis, uh, you can actually differentiate the types of analysis in terms of linear and nonlinear analysis. Under linear, we have two, the linear static procedure and linear dynamic procedure, which can be think of as an equivalent static procedure and a response spectrum procedure. And then we have the nonlinear analysis, which is divided into nonlinear static analysis or the pushover analysis and the nonlinear time history analysis. So what to use, linear or nonlinear? Well, if we try to define what we mean by linear, when we say linear, we do not include explicitly the, the analysis of inelastic behavior of members. What do we mean by this? That means we do not use the capacity of section beyond their inelastic range, and we do not consider the degradations in the structure. Uh, that is why we are only including what we call modification factor in our reinforced concrete, because we want to capture this strength degradations. No? But really in conducting linear analysis, we are not capturing that strength degradation in structural members. Now, having these reasons, understanding this implication also would help us justify the need for us to understand and learn the linear analysis. Of course, when we do nonlinear analysis, there are several sources of nonlinearity. It can be boundary nonlinearity, material nonlinearity, and geometric nonlinearity. While in conducting performance-based velocity, what we are focused is our focus is on material nonlinearity, particularly plasticity, and also geometric nonlinearity, particularly P delta effect of what we call large displacement effects. Motivations in using nonlinear analysis. Well, these are commentary uh, taken from ASCE 4113 and 4117, which tells us that in recognition, in recognition of the improved presentation of building behavior when nonlinear analysis is conducted, the nonlinear procedures were found to have less conservative limits than the linear procedures. And buildings that are found to be seismically deficient based on linear analysis may actually comply with this standard if a nonlinear analysis is performed. So, uh, these are based on the uh, past studies of some of the authors in the literature. Now, I will now introduce uh, the international existing building code. So what is this IEBC and what is not? <clears throat> now, IEBC was actually introduced with the objective to preserve the existing building stock by dividing, by, by providing a reasonable set of technical requirements and associated costs. And Martin and Alice put it that it is not practical really to require buildings to be constantly updated to meet current code provisions, right? And so therefore the objective of the IABC is to provide some flexibility for the owners as well as the code official by allowing them to treat existing buildings differently. So what is IEBC then? Well, we can say that IEBC can be the arbitrator between those engineers who preferred code-based assessment and those engineers who preferred uh, performance-based assessment. Because IEBC allows you to use either code-based methods or performance-based methods in conducting a seismic evaluation, okay? Let's be clear on that. So the IEBC is a model document that is already implemented in the US and the procedure that, out, that were outlined in the IEBC allows you to use either code-based methods or performance-based method in conducting a seismic evaluation. Now, for example, 
the IEBC set now two procedures or two-step procedure that you can select when you want to conduct a seismic evaluation, depending on the type of work you are going to perform. So that means the selection of the type of compliance depends on the type of work you are going to perform on an existing structure. And this compliance method is actually categorized into two. One is what we call the full compliance method. And the second is what we call the reduced compliance method. In the full compliance method, you are required to use full seismic forces. And in that case, if you are using code-based approach, you will use 100% of the seismic forces determined using the current code. Or if you are using a uh, performance-based procedure, you will use ASCE 41, tier three procedure in conducting an evaluation with a performance objective of PPOM, which is equivalent to new structure. Or if your work only requires the use of reduced seismic forces, then you are allowed by this IABC code to use only 75% of the seismic load determined using current code. If you are using a code-based evaluation or ASCE 41 with a building performance objective of BPOE. So clearly it gives you an option. If you, you prefer code-based assessment, you can you go with the code base, but your seismic force that you will, the seismic force that you will use in your design shall be based on the type of work that you will be doing. So that means you will either use full seismic force or reduce seismic force. Similarly, if you are conducting performance, if you are using performance-based philosophy, if there is a certain work that would require you to do the evaluation using a BPON performance objective, and there are certain work that would require you to use or would allow you to use BPOE performance objective. So what are the work that would require compliance with seismic force? When there is a change in occupancy, when there is a change in use, if there is a change in use, then you are required to use full seismic force. That means 100% of the earthquake load using code-based procedure or a BPON performance objective using ASE 41. When there are addition in a structure, when there are addition in structure again, you are required to use full seismic force, 100% earthquake using code base, and again, BPON using performance base. Now you are allowed to use reduced seismic force when there are alterations, but we need to define what do we mean by alterations? Well, alteration is any construction or renovation to an existing structure other than repair and addition. And if this is the work that you will perform, you are allowed to use reduced seismic force. So if you use code-based procedure, then you are allowed to use 75% of the seismic load calculated using new code, or if you are using performance-based procedure, you are allowed to use a BPOE performance objective. Now, when you are doing a repair, when you are doing a repair on a structure, then you are again allowed to use reduced seismic force. Now, you are also allowed to, to use reduced seismic force when you are doing an evaluation of an existing structure, of an historic building. Now we should define that historic building is the one that should be listed or recognized by the National Historical Commission of the Philippines or as designated by a local government. So in evaluating such existing stock, in evaluating such historical structure, we are allowed to use reduced seismic load and also reduce wind loads. That means we are allowed to use wind loads that are based on the loads in effect at the time of original construction, except when the damage is caused by wind, okay? So in that case, uh, we can 
we, we, we are not required to use the new window provision in evaluating historic structures. So as an overview of IEBC, basically there are only 15 chapters. And it is important to note that IEBC is not just focused on structural. It's a complete document that considers both fire, architectural, and other disciplines. So it is uh, really a, a whole document for uh, existing structure that is not only, that is not only catering uh, structural evaluation. Uh, now, I would like now to proceed with presenting to you a hypothetical comparison uh, between a code-based evaluation and performance-based evaluation of a structural view. Now, with the introduction of the IEBC and the option for us to use either a code-based assessment and performance-based assessment, there's a natural question of if I'm gonna use performance-based philosophy and code-based philosophy, would I arrive in the same evaluation of an existing structure? That is a very natural question. Now, in order to answer this, I tried to develop a, a simple example that would somehow help us provide an insight on the differences between the, the two evaluation procedures. Now, as a disclaimer, okay, so this example does not really fully describe the procedures in both code-based and performance-based evaluation. And it is just intended to provide a high-level comparison of the two approaches to increase our insights on the difference of the two methods. So that's the purpose of uh, showing you this example. So in this example, we are to evaluate a cantilever beam that is subjected to a concentrated load P. Now the assumption is that this load represents already a force equivalent to a design level earthquake DBE. No? So it is already reduced by R, assuming. And we shall assume that for this example, that we are allowed to use reduced seismic loading. So therefore probably, in evaluating this part of the structure, um, the work that we are conducting, for example, is a repair because a repair work, according to IEBC, allows you to use reduced seismic load. So what we're going to do now is to evaluate this beam using a code-based assessment. That means we are allowed to use 75% of the load and using performance-based assessment, using nonlinear static analysis. So the target solution, sorry, the target solution is a code-based evaluation using 75% of the load and a performance-based evaluation using nonlinear static analysis. Now, as an assumption, this hypothetical example assumes that the load has already been determined both using code-based approach and using ASCE 41. The load P is assumed to be equivalent to a load corresponding to a seismic hazard equivalent to the sign level earthquake. Thus, for a code-based evaluation of reduced load, the applied load is taken as 75% of P, which is equal to 45 kilonewton. Now, for the performance-based evaluation, BPOE, because it's an existing structure, requires two demand levels, and that is a BPSE1, 20% in 50, and BSE 2E, 5% in 50. And of course, we need to evaluate this two seismic hazard level according to an immediate occupancy performance level for BSE 1E, and according to a collapse prevention performance level under BSE 2E. Now, the BSE 1E load is a load that is less than DBE. So using EC8 and the work presented, by Kowski and Alusi, we were able to approximate the load for BSE1E to be equal to 0.75 of P. Now the demand that we use corresponding to BSE2E, of course, is expected to be higher than the design basis earthquake, but it's not greater, of course, 
two MCE. So again, using the same calculation above, we were able to estimate a value of P corresponding to BSE2E equal to 1.3 of P. So these are the loads that were used in code-based assessment, 45% of 45 kilonewton, equivalent to 75% of P, while for performance-based evaluation, we have 45 kilonewton under BSE2E for immediate occupancy and 78 kilonewton for collapse prevention performance evaluation. So we were able to calculate here the demand. Uh, we have 90 kilonewton meter for the flexural demand and a shear demand of 45 kilonewton. So we start our solution using code-based assessment. Uh, of course, using code-based assessment, we calculated the demand in terms of forces, 90 kilonewton meter for flexural demand and 45 kilonewton for shear demand. Now the capacity of the section given this information can now be determined using the principles of concrete mechanics. And this is what we got. The section capacity nominal is 124.9 kilonewton meter and the shear nominal capacity, including the shear reinforcement, 224 kilonewton. So we were able to calculate a DCR of 0.72 for flexure and 0.2 for shear, which leads us to a conclusion that flexure controls for this beam. So it is now, can be now conclude that under code-based evaluation, the beam is safe. So now let us proceed to performance-based evaluation using nonlinear static analysis. Note that based on the DCR, we can already assume that the beam is deformation controlled because it is controlled by flexure. Now, of course, in conducting nonlinear static analysis, we need to model the beam uh, by, by choosing a material model for both concrete and steel. Now, in this assessment, I initially checked the, to use the modified Hogmestad method in modeling the concrete behavior and also tried to use the Mander et al. and compare the two. Now, sometimes uh, in modeling the, the behavior of reinforced concrete elements, one might forget to also model the tension behavior of concrete, but it's very important, particularly if you are modeling, if you are using fiber modeling to actually use uh, a model also for concrete intention. So in this case, we just utilize a linear brittle model for concrete under tension. Now, for modeling steel reinforcement, we adopted what we call a bilinear model. Basically, it is the elastoplastic model. And in conducting, in calculating the moment curvature relationship for this beam, we utilize a fiber modeling analysis. Uh, I, have, uh, I have written a code that is uh, based on what we call uh, using Fortran language. And although I, I intend to actually uh, transfer the code into MATLAB to make it more user-friendly. Now, in conducting the fiber element modeling and analysis, if you compare the Mander et al. model with the mo modified Hovestad model, you will see here that selecting a concrete model or concrete material model can have a huge impact in modeling, in the nonlinear modeling of your beam. And this is actually the result of the compressive uh, stress in the beam. So you will see the difference uh, between the two when you use a different material model. So since uh, I consider that the Mander et al. model is more applicable, so I use this model in developing the backbone curve for this beam. Now using this information, uh, I now calculated and adopted an equation for calculating the plastic hinge length in order to transform my curvature into rotation. Now this equation was actually obtained based on the recommended uh, equation by NIST and Lee Herb. So I was able to calculate the value of the length of plastic hinge for this beam equal to 298 
millimeter. Now, using that uh, plastic hinge length, I was able now to develop my backbone curve, which is uh, this one, which is now in terms of moment and rotation. And it is normalized by the yielding rotation and the yielding moment. Now, of course, in modeling using a nonlinear static analysis, you also need to input some of the uh, acceptance criteria. And using these conditions, I selected uh, a condition that is between the two, but instead of uh, doing interpolation, I adopted the lower value in modeling the acceptance criteria. Now, sometimes when we are adapting the acceptance criteria for rotation, it is uh, quite difficult to imagine this uh, rotation values given the SCD41. So as a guide, I provided you these illustrations of rotations that were conducted in an experimental test. And you will see here that if you have a rotation of around 0 0.04 radian, then these are the types of cracking that you can already see in a reinforced concrete. While if you have a rotation of 0 0.08 radian, this is already the type of cracking that you can expect. So you can see here, if you compare these values of rotations in ASCE 41, okay, this is 0 0.04, so the behavior of the beam is probably in this region. So it's a, good, um, it's a good reference for you to have a visual, um, a visual, a visualization of the rotations that are actually presented in ASCE 41. So what are the results? For nonlinear static analysis, this is the capacity or pushover curve that was uh, a result of the analysis using ETABs. So you will see here that the formation of plastic hinge for immediate occupancy was obtained when the load applied is 69.3 kilonewton, whereas the formation of life safety hinge was obtained when P is 60.7. Now for this beam, however, it was not able to achieve a collapse prevention performance level because after the formation of life safety plastic hinge, this beam collapses can be seen by this degradation. So for this case, what we can say, I'm sorry, what we can say is that under performance-based evaluation, the beam passes the immediate occupancy performance, but fail to meet the collapse prevention performance for a BSE 2E. So as a concluding remarks from the comparison, the capacity of the beam was found acceptable using code-based evaluation while the beam was also found acceptable using performance-based evaluation under immediate occupancy performance. However, the beam was found to, to be acceptable for BSE2E collapse prevention performance. It was found in the comparison that there was a formation of life safety plastic hinge at a capacity of 70.67. Now, if you were to compare this value, we can say that both comparisons shows that the beam is adequate under life safety performance. However, using performance-based assessment using ASCE 41, the beam was not able to meet the BP, uh, the PPOE, particularly BSE 2E, collapse prevention performance level required in ASCE 41. So to support this uh, conclusion, if you are to read the other works, particularly the data of Safar, who actually perform a, a detailed comparison between code-based design buildings and performance-based design buildings using ASCE 41. And this, this is one of the findings in the result of Safar. So you will notice here that if a building was designed using code-based assessment, and using ELF procedure, and you perform a analysis using ASCE 41, if the analysis was performed using linear procedure, some of the beams would have higher DCR as compared to an analysis that was run using nonlinear models or nonlinear methods. Similarly, if 
you perform an analysis using response spectrum method and, com and run this analysis using ASCE 41. Again, there is a discrepancy between the results of non-linear methods and linear methods, as you can be observed by this figure. So what is the conclusion of SATAR? The conclusion is that using LSP procedure, code compliant elements may fail to meet the collapse prevention performance of ASCE 41, which is similar to what, uh, what result we have for that B. And similar to LSP and LDP procedure, code compliant elements also fail to meet the performance goal for the ASCE 41, particularly when nonlinear static analysis is used under collapse prevention performance level. Now, the number of elements that didn't pass the ASCE 41 acceptance criteria was higher when linear procedures are employed as compared when using nonlinear procedures. However, in the final conclusion, if you actually use nonlinear dynamic procedure, then uh, it will show to you that even those members that fail using linear procedures in ASC 41 can still pass the assessment if you use nonlinear dynamic procedures. So as a concluding remark for this, uh, webinar for this presentation. Uh, so basically in this lecture, I introduce the international existing building code, which can actually solve the impasse between those who are in favor of code-based evaluation and those who are in favor of performance-based evaluation. Now, both methods as proven by several authors can yield life safety design with one more conservative than the other. A performance-based evaluation, however, provides us additional information, particularly when higher performance level is desired because it allows us to select a target performance for a certain structure. Now, there are consistencies in the result of both code-based and performance-based design, and these inconsistencies are normally magnified particularly when you are using linear procedures in ASCE 41. So thank you for uh, listening and I hope you learned something from this uh, presentation. Thank you, Doc Mack, for that uh, very enlightened, uh, enlightening uh, presentation. Uh, I have a, some few questions here from, the, uh, from our uh, participants. Uh, so let me read the first question. Are the evaluation of or assessment reports acceptable as legal document during litigation cases? Uh, especially most code references are based on other code on other countries code like the American code. Okay, actually, uh, I would say it depends on the type of evaluation you are performing. Uh, again, this is an issue about uh, uh, legality, you know, and certain, uh, it is very certain that in our practice of this profession, we are the, the code that we should use in order to protect us as a structural engineer is really the National Structural Code of the Philippines. Now, of course, we are allowed to use uh, as references other standards in other country. Um, but again, the minimum requirements of the code must be, uh, must be complied in order to ensure that we don't have any uh, legal issues in this type of uh, assessment. Again, it really depends upon the type of work that you are doing. But uh, based on this practice that uh, I had, uh, it's really, really depend on the type of work. And I have referenced this US standards, particularly if, if it is a structural condition assessment, something like that. I think as long as you comply to the minimum requirements of the NSCP, um, I think you're good. 
Okay, thank you for that. We have another uh, question from question from uh, the, the our, our uh, participants. Uh, do we have existing codes for blast assessment in the Philippines? Uh, if there is, are we implementing it? Uh, no, uh, currently we don't have an existing code for uh, blast design in the Philippines. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, another one is in order to implement the use of IEBC in the Philippines, it needs to have a direct reference from the governing structural code and standards. Is the use of the provisions of the IEBC permitted in the NSCP? Oh, well, uh, currently uh, the NSCP is not referring to the IBC, IEBC and to be actually, in fact, uh, we don't have uh, a code for existing structures right now in the Philippines, but IEBC was really developed as a model code, right? So uh, any other code in other countries can actually adopt the IEBC as their code for evaluating existing structures. And that is something I think probably Sir Rani can, can answer in the future, probably. Okay, yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, in the evaluation of an engineering structure, is it not required to do NDT? Uh, I think this means uh, non-destructive tests together with the theoretical calculation evaluation of the strength. Uh, yes, uh, as I mentioned, structural evaluation can actually consist of a structural assessment or structural analysis or both. And in the structural assessment part, the structural assessment may include determination of in place strength of materials in order for us to, to perform structural analysis. So yes, a part of the evaluation excuse me, is determining the in-place properties of the materials, either uh, destructive methods or non-destructive methods. However, I would like to point out that using non-destructive methods alone is not allowed to quantify the in-place properties of materials. Yeah, in fact, we also have a semi non-destructive test as well as uh, yeah, destructive test. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, well, I think a question for if we have a copy of the lectures, I think it was uh, answered before in the, uh, <clears throat> during the first, before this uh, uh, webinar started. Uh, another question is, how old should be the building so that para iasesya for, for aging of structures? Again, uh, in the presentation, I qualify the, the trigger for structural evaluation, which is an aging of structure. And normally we do it when there is already some doubt, no? for example, physical evidence of, uh, of deterioration in the structure. Or for example, since it is aging, it may be probably triggered by seismic evaluation. And that trigger of seismic evaluation may be due to the fact that the building was constructed way back when we don't have yet a code specifically addresses earthquake detailing, for example. And in such cases, um, seismic evaluation should be performed on that structure in order to check, not to, not to make the structure comply with the existing code, but really to understand the response of the structural uh, building and to ensure that it will provide a minimum level of safety to the occupants of the building. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, another question is, uh, is peer review required in using uh, PBD in the Philippine setting? What is the liability of the peer reviewer? Uh, well, we don't have uh, yet rules in the Philippines on how to do this PBD, but internationally, yes, there are some, there are requirements that a a evaluation or design using performance-based approach must be peer-reviewed. So that is a requirement in uh, international setting. But uh, based on practice here in the Philippines, uh, when I, I work for some of the consulting firms, uh, I've seen that uh, most of this PBD are really peer-reviewed. 
Yeah. Like the uh, your work in San Sebastian, which is an international peer reviewer. Okay, uh, in performing a nonlinear analysis, can performing a nonlinear analysis can minimize or eliminate unnecessary seismic retrofit? What are or what is the tendency of using this method? Mm, can can you repeat that, uh, Doctor? Uh, uh, okay, see, sorry for that. Performing a nonlinear analysis can minimize or eliminate unnecessary seismic retrofit. What is the tendency of using this method? So basically, it's a choice. Yeah, so really, if uh, you are competent in using this method, I think uh, it's always good to use nonlinear procedures. I think if you are competent in using this method. So uh, it's not that you just want to use this method because um, you think it will reduce the cost of doing the retrofit. But the first criteria of using nonlinear analysis is you must understand the results of the method. You must be com competent enough in understanding what are the risks of using this method. Because as you may see in the in the example that I've shown, there are several assumptions that you need to use in doing a nonlinear analysis from the selection of material models of concrete and steel. There's already a, uh, a huge variation, okay? Because there are several models that you can use for modeling concrete and steel. And then there are also parameters like the length of plastic hinge. There are several equations available in the literature for you to use or, or uh, different equations that you can use in estimating the length of plastic hitch, which all of them can actually influence your backbone curve or your material modeling. And of course, the material modeling uh, would be an important parameter when you compare it with the acceptance criteria in ASCE 41. So really the first thing to do is you must understand first the consequences uh, or the, the limitations uh, in doing this analysis. And if you understand these limitations and you are competent enough to do this nonlinear modeling, I would still advise that uh, you use nonlinear analysis in conducting such evaluation. But it is important to remember that all engineers that are using nonlinear analysis would first perform a linear analysis in doing their evaluation, just to give you a feel about the, the, the DCR of the structure, for example. Okay, uh, uh, thank you for that, Doc, uh, Doc Mack. Uh, I have here uh, our asset uh, director, uh, Engineer Maricon Pineda, who would like to answer this question uh, live. Uh, Maricon? Okay. Uh, Maybe we'll, let's, okay, I think Maricon's here. Maricon, you have the floor. Okay, probably. Another question is, uh, what should be considered in choosing concrete models, since there's a lot of existing concrete models? Uh, well, to be honest, uh, there are no really like restriction, but uh, of course you, you would need to adopt those that are commonly used by several authors in, the, in practice. And of course, one of the commonly used models is the Mandir at all model in modeling uh, concrete behavior. Okay, uh, we still have uh, yeah. time, okay. Uh, Performance-based evaluation is highly necessary with high-rise structures rather than low-rise structures. Can you, can you repeat that, uh, Dr. G, sorry? Uh, yes, performance-based evaluation is highly necessary with high-rise structures rather than low-rise structures? 
Oh yes, uh, one reason for that is because uh, tall buildings uh, behave more non-linearly no? than uh, low-rise structures. Yes, but uh, that does that, that does not mean that you are not allowed to use non-linear analysis or low-rise buildings. Okay. Uh... Okay, another question is, uh, <clears throat> where, is where did it go? If the building, if the building satisfy code based design, but fails in collapse prevention performance, does it mean retrofit is not warranted? If no retrofit will be implemented, how do we explain to the client that the building does not satisfy uh, collapse prevention performance? Well, uh, number one, I think you, do, you don't need to mix the two procedure in conducting an evaluation of existing structure. So I think from the very first start, you need already to select an approach for you to follow in conducting the evaluation. So it's, it's not that you start with the code base and then you try to switch with the, uh, with the performance-based velocity. So I think you need to define that initially in your evaluation that you will use this method of analysis. And in doing so, for example, um, if the building did not, did not meet a certain performance objective, uh, that just mean that uh, under that specific target performance, your, build, your structure or structural member will not able to comply with that performance level. So uh, in, in, the, in the wordings of ESC 41, you are then fail to meet the certain performance objective criteria. Because in ASE 41, for example, if you evaluated at BSE 1E and BSE 2E and you fail to comply one of this two level evaluation, then the entire evaluation is considered unacceptable. Okay, uh, related to that, uh, to that Doc Mac, uh, we have a question here. Based on ASC 41-17, and ASE 41-13, BSE-1N should be two-thirds of MCER risk targeted. It is not implicitly stated that you cannot use DBE, uh, the 475 return period. However, it is noted in the commentary that you can still use 475 return, return period and other return periods. Should the use of 475 be an enhanced building performance ob objective, like the classification of BPON for BSE-1 instead of being under BPON? It's quite a long question. Yes, uh, I, I think in the ASCE 41, aside from the two building performance objective, which is one is for existing structure and the other one is for new structure. There are other building performance objective that we call enhanced objective, and there are also what we call reduce objective. And I, I, I think you can you can actually reclassify some of the seismic hazard level in order to qualify for this uh, different level of objective. So in between the BPOE and BPON, there are some other seismic level that you can actually adopt and they are noted as uh, enhanced performance objective and even a reduced performance objective if you would allow additional damage to your structure. Thank you for that, Dr. Mac. Uh, what else? Uh, what? will be the criteria that we will follow to know if a structure can be rehab rehabilitated by using retrofitting techniques. Can I say that again? What will be the criteria that we are following 
to know if a structure can be rehabilitated by using retrofitting techniques. Maybe if I may rephrase the question, maybe the question here is, for example, if a structure is already damaged, how can you say it can be still retrofitted? Probably that is the question, no, Dr. G. Yes. Yeah, I, I think in, in doing uh, an evaluation of existing structure, the first objective is to do first a gravity assessment. Right? Uh, because the uh, gravity assessment is at the minimum, must be the minimum level of safety that you can provide. So if it can no longer uh, support gravity assessment, then that means uh, you don't even need to, to conduct a, a seismic evaluation because the first thing that you should check is that the building must be able to carry the gravity loads that it support or so that it can continue its service. Okay, uh, probably one last question, Doc Ma, uh, before we end this, uh, this uh, exciting presentation, question and answer. The challenge, here's the question, the challenge in evaluating strength of old structure is the non-availability of as-built plans. Any comment? Yeah, uh, I agree, no, uh, definitely. That is one of the uh, difficult uh, part of doing uh, evaluation of existing structures, particularly in the Philippines, because we don't tend to uh, keep records of this uh, as built drawings that we have. So of course, uh, the way to do it is to develop what we call as found drawings and develop uh, your own drawings based on as measured uh, information. It is only important to note that when you develop these drawings, you must specifically put in the drawings that these are as-found drawings and they are not as-built drawings. Uh, and definitely as-built drawings will never be the same as as-found drawings. Mm -hmm. What you need to do is just to declare to your client that these are the basis of your evaluation or these are the basis that you use in evaluating their structure. Okay, thank you uh, very much, Dr. Mack, for that uh, presentation and as well as the, uh, the exchange of uh, questions from, the, from our participants and uh, your, uh, your answers to those questions. Although we thank still you, have a lot of questions uh, from our uh, participants, uh, as mentioned earlier by uh, Francis Valderrama, we, the panelist or the speaker, Dr. Mack, Mendoza can uh, send his comments, answers uh, later on to questions that uh, have not been answered in this uh, Q&A portion. Thank you very much. And uh, let me turn you over to our next, uh, to Engineer Leo, who will-, uh, will Thank uh, you, Dr. G. See, thank you very much, Dr. Ma. We will continue with this program. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Garciano, and thank you, Dr. Mendoza, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Now we will go on with uh, the rest, our sponsor pres presentation, and after which we will do the assessment exam. I would like to remind every attendee to please answer.